Okay. Uh, so again, welcome folks. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to Shell and Heidi uh, to introduce themselves further and to um, begin the training. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, and thanks y'all for being here on a Friday uh, for this third part of our marathon training. We really appreciate your time and energy this morning. Uh, my name is Heidi Lersch. I am an educator and training coordinator with Safe's Disability Services Department. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I'm currently on a grant from the Texas Council for Developmental Disabilities to create an accessible, healthy relationship and safer sexuality curriculum for adults with IDD. Um, and I'm gonna pass it to Michelle so she can also introduce herself. Okay, thanks Heidi. Um, my name is Michelle Schwartz and um, I've been with SAFE about 23 years. Um, my passion is working to end violence against people with disabilities. That includes people with developmental, intellectual, mental health, um, and other um, kinds of abuse. Um, I started out in the field of psychology and um, as a survivor recognized pretty fast that I had too many triggers to do therapy. So um, I ended up in research and began to observe the many ways that people with disabilities were disempowered. And um, when I applied for an educator trainer position at SAFE and interviewed, I was hooked. So I think I'm staying here and I really care about this work. And um, I'm happy for the opportunity to share with you um, today. So Heidi's gonna, um, I'm gonna pass it back to you, Heidi, so you can um, get us started. All right, so um, today's the third part of our training on trauma-informed care, mental health, and substance use. Shell, do you have control of the slides? I'm trying to do. There we go. So um, we are coming to you from SAFE. Uh, SAFE stands for Stop Abuse for Everyone. It's an awesome area crisis center. We provide intervention and prevention services for survivors of child abuse, domestic violence, sexual assault, trafficking, and exploitation. Um, and we offer, we've got a 24 hour hotline. We have prevention services in the schools. Um, we have a deaf share program and our disability services program um, also does prevention services. If you have more questions about SAFE, be happy. We would be happy to answer those at the end of our presentation today. A little bit about disability services. So our program has been around for about 24 years. And when we first started, we were really at the forefront of looking at violence in the lives of people with disabilities and how we can work to prevent that violence um, by creating cultural change. Some of the ways that we're currently working to prevent violence in the lives of people with disabilities are we provide training for people with disabilities on topics such as health, healthy relationships, safer sexuality and personal safety. Um, we also provide trainings um, for anyone in the lives of people with disabilities uh, so we're talking about disability service organizations, DVSA organizations, families, parents, um, medical staff, criminal justice staff, um, law enforcement, um, and many others. And we're continually working with our community partners to recognize and address gaps in victim services for people with disabilities. Um, so everything that you're going to see here today and that's in the PowerPoint that Michelle shared with you comes from our manual Beyond Labels, um, it, which is a guide for working with survivors with mental health um, disabilities and substance use. Uh, so if you are really into what we talk about today and you want to learn more um, and explore that further, I really encourage you to visit our website and um, purchase the Beyond Manuals label. I also want to acknowledge um, our peer support program as just being an invaluable resource in the development of this manual. Um, our peer support program really guided us um, and shared their lived experience um, as well as their experience as professionals in peer support. Um, and they're really invaluable in creating, creating this manual. 
So our learning objectives for today, we're going to do a quick, quick review of language around mental health and substance use when you're working with survivors. Language is just so important. Has the You have the ability to um, really shame and, and, and create other barriers for survivors or to um, interact with individuals with compassion and support their recovery, depending on what language you use. Um, Michelle's going to talk about the impact of trauma and how that affects thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and how trauma contributes to um, a person's mental health and or um, their substance use. And then um, we're also going to talk about how you can enhance your accessibility in all of your services and policies um, to make sure that you are providing services that are accessible to survivors who have mental health um, symptoms and who use substances. So we'll start with language. What is mental health? So there are a lot of definitions out there. Um, one that we like is that um, mental health and well being includes a person's feeling that they are coping, that they are fairly in control of their lives, and that they can manage challenges and responsibilities. Um, and we like this definition because it centers the person as the expert in their own mental health. Um, and I know we're probably all familiar with centering survivors as the expert in their experiences, and they're also the experts in their own mental health. And so instead of us on the outside judging what someone's mental health is, not, not having you know, the expertise to really do that, it, um, we always wanna shift back to the survivor and what is their feeling of their mental health, what is their own experience of their mental health and how they are currently coping. Um, some, some other factors when um, you're talking with a survivor about their mental health that can help that conversation are looking at um, how the survivor feels they are productive um, in their activities, um, are, do their relationships feel fulfilling, um, do they feel like they have the ability to adapt and change and cope currently, or do they need more support, and this can help you as you're helping a survivor evaluate their own mental health needs. So um, it's important to recognize that um, many survivors also have mental health symptoms. And sometimes those mental health symptoms are um, a result of trauma that they have experienced. So, and sometimes we don't know um, what is a trauma response and what is a mental health symptom. And it's not necessary that we always know the distinction um, because we can approach with compassion, um, with options and um, providing support regardless of, of um, why that behavior or that symptom has manifested. Um, it's, also always really important that we remember that um, recovery is risky for survivors um, because it often means letting go of coping mechanisms that previously allowed them to survive trauma. So whether that's a, that coping mechanism is a behavioral reaction that they've used to protect themselves or that coping mechanism is substance use that they have used in order to um, continue to be able to um, live with, with um, extreme amounts of trauma that they have experienced. Um, but when we're asking survivors to engage in healing and engage in recovery and continue to make progress, we are asking them to take enormous risks. Um, it's risky for them to connect with others, to um, develop new relationships and to take on new coping mechanisms. There's so much risk involved there and there's, there's a lot of um, understandable fear that comes with that. So keeping that in mind really helps us um, approach behavior and substance use and mental health um, with more compassion, knowing survivors are in a state of risk when they are in recovery. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about diagnosis um, and just language around diagnosis and mental health. So. Again, it's always important to center the survivor as the expert in their experience and, and the expert in their own mental health. Um, if a survivor does have a diagnosis, that doesn't mean that you know what that survivor needs even related to that diagnosis. Um, it's always good to educate yourself um, on, on mental health um, disorders and diagnoses, but that doesn't mean that you then become the expert um, because you 
have done that education. It can help you provide options for a survivor, but it's not like, oh, I know your diagnosis, so here are the things that we really need to look at. Um, it's more like, hey, let's talk about the, this diagnosis. What does it mean to you? Do you relate to this diagnosis? And always remembering to ask the question um, about what are your needs in this moment, you know, related to your mental health or related to your recovery in general. Um, And of course, if the diagnosis isn't relevant to the conversation, then it's not your place to disclose it ever. Um, that's a, always the individual's choice whether or not to disclose their diagnosis. Um, and, and that's for many reasons. Um, one, just being self-determination that we want to um, allow survivors to um, self-identify in every area, including um, mental health. But we also, need to remember that oftentimes a survivor might receive a diagnosis that is wrong <laughs> or they might receive a diagnosis that they do not relate to. And so referring to that diagnosis, um, naming that diagnosis often can really damage um, your ability to build trust with that survivor if that's not something that they relate to. Um, and, you know, in, in our society still, there's so much stigma around mental health diagnoses. And so depending on what the diagnosis is, bringing up that diagnosis might perpetuate that stigma, especially in professional circles. Um, so you, you really want to be careful about when and how you're referring to a survivor's diagnosis. Is it absolutely necessary? Are you making sure um, that you're respecting that survivor's confidentiality and right to self-determination um, as far as mental health? You always wanna use, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Michelle, I just, Kind of jumped You're going to go back. <laughs> yeah, just for one second. Sure. Um, you always want to use, you want to default to person first language, but also remember that many people use identity first language. So um, you want to check in with the survivor about how they talk about their identity and how they talk about their diagnosis if they have one. Um, but if, if you're not familiar, person first language is where you put the person before the diagnosis. So you would say a person with schizophrenia, you wouldn't say a schizophrenic. Um, and then of course, be cautious with reclaimed terms. So you never wanna use the word in general, you never wanna use the word crazy or psychotic or nuts or, you know, um, you don't wanna use those terms, one, because it's offensive and it, and it perpetuates that stigma, um, but also because it's not your place to do that. We know that, that people who have those identities might choose to, to reclaim um, those terms um, as an act of empowerment and we respect that, but we, we would not mirror that language. Um, a little bit about language in the DSM-5 regarding substance use. So um, there is a cultural and professional shift happening right now, getting away from um, terms that um, perpetuate stigma and shame, such as um, an addict, um, abuse, um, and so the DSM-5 is moving in that direction. And so you'll you see that they've removed a lot of that um, stigmatized language um, and they're moving towards talking about making sure that they're centering the person in the diagnosis and removing any language that um, that's shameful and that um, talks about someone's disorder as a, as a character deficit. Um, it is, it's great forward movement, yes. I saw Michelle's comment in the chat. Um, so a, a little bit more about what's currently in the DSM-5. What we see is that uh, in the DSM-5, it talks about substance use on a continuum. Um, and this can be helpful in your own understanding of, of where someone might be with their substance use, but it can be helpful in conversations that you're having with the survivor and, and um, you know, helping them evaluate their own substance use and where they might be on that continuum and what kind of supports and treatment they might need or want based on their current substance use. You can go to the next slide, Michelle. Thank you. Um, so we say at one end of the continuum, we have kind of beginning and mild substance use. Um, and some of the things that we see on that side of the continuum are um, this, the person might be using substances and they might continue to use substances even though there are negative consequences, but they're not at the point yet where um, 
it's an uncontrollable chronic relapsing condition. They have an extreme level of tolerance and also um, have extreme experiences with withdrawal when they're sort of going, if they are trying to withdraw from the substance use. Again, on the beginning and, and um, mild substance use um, end of the continuum, we see that when people do stop and on that end of the continuum, they are able to stop um, that they feel better. On the other end of the continuum, um, we see that people tend to feel worse when they stop using if they can stop or if they do stop for a short period of time. Um, and that's due to, to the more extreme um, withdrawal symptoms. The other end of the continuum, beginning, mild, beginning and mild substance use, um, we do see that the substance use is starting to have negative um, impacts on um, areas of the person's life, such as legal, social, and health. But it's not at the point where they are no longer engaging in work or social activities at all. That's on the other end of, of the continuum with the severe substance use. Um, so they might, at beginning and mild substance use, might result in failure to fulfill obligations, whether those are personal or professional, um, but they are still engaging in personal and professional activities. Um, and then at the other end of the continuum, the severe substance use, um, we see people are trying to control and stop their substance use, but they are not able to um, because of those brain changes that, that have happened um, due to continued use. And so at that point, then we're looking at talking about supports and seeing if the survivor is open to treatment at that time. Um, but all of this can help you um, in your conversations with the survivor, sort of, hey, where are you at? How do you feel? You're, how do you feel um, that your substance use is impacting you know, these areas of your life? What supports do you need now or for the future? Um, or can we continue this conversation? It might just be a starting point. Um, so a little bit more about stigma, talked a lot about um, how we're making a shift away from using language um, and approaches that perpetuate stigma and shame um, for survivors with mental health symptoms um, and survivors who use substances. And we actually know based on research that the more shame a person feels around their substance use, the less likely they are to be successful in recovery from substance use. So it's just so, so important. Um, it's one of the most important things that we can do when we're interacting with survivors is making sure that we are not contributing to the shame that they already feel um, that society has already put on them as survivors of um, domestic um, violence, sexual assault, and other forms um, of abuse. So, okay, thank you, um, Heidi. Um, that was a great recap of, of everything that you shared last month um, with some added value. Um, I'm going to do the same thing around trauma. Very briefly, um, go back over and just remind about a couple of things related to trauma. You know, all of us consider our work is trauma specific. And so to me, that means um, everyone that walks in our door, we consider to have survived some kind of violence um, or some kind of trauma, whether it's domestic, family violence, sexual assault, um, care provider abuse or exploitation, um, any form of violence. If they walk in, in fact, this also um, a kind of applies to um, everyone we encounter. We never know if a person has experienced some form of violence, but certainly when they walk through our door, we, we know. And so we want to make sure that all of our interactions are trauma informed. So what is trauma? Just a very brief recap. Um, we define it as what happens to a person when their mind and their body experience danger, um, a situation where their life is threatened or there's a threat to their physical integrity or their right to decide what is going to happen to their body or what is going to happen to the body of others. A traumatic event could be uh, witnessing or experiencing sexual assault, living through a disaster, um, as we've been experiencing over and over again, just in our society and over the last year and a half, 
uh, being a witness to violence. And then sometimes, um, sometimes a person can actively mobilize protective or defensive responses, but at other times the nervous system and, and their um, experiences with coping skills are just completely overwhelmed and the person ends up in a state of terror and helplessness hopelessness and a loss of control. So a traumatic experience is gonna make us feel helpless, threatens our boundaries and our usual coping strategies and overwhelms our capacity to feel like a sense of control over ourselves, over our immediate environment, maintain our connections with others and make meaning um, of our experiences. Um, you know, I think I think we've experienced so much of this. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, at what point we, at what point in our day-to-day -day life, we're gonna reach a point, a place where every time we turn on the news or every time we check our, our cell phones for updates, there's not gonna be another trauma of some kind looking at us um, that we, we need to deal with. So, um, I just think it's important for us as those who work in the field to also recognize how much has been heaped upon those of us in the field and then those of us who are already survivors that we're working with. It just seems like a time when understanding trauma and how to support ourselves and others um, through traumatic experiences is, is just so important and has become so much more real to me over, over the last year and a half, two years. I never thought I would be showing up at the grocery store with a mask, with a, um, a shield, with gloves, with long sleeve, um, you know, long sleeve clothes, shoes, looking, you know, like I had a homemade hazmat suit. You know, we are living in, we have been living in trauma. And so, um, yeah, I don't know why I'm saying that, except it's just, it feels like this is where we're living now. So as Heidi pointed out, labels can be very damaging and really um, misinterpret a survivor's true experiences. And I also believe that changing the ways we label behavior can also help us improve our response in those crisis or challenging situations. For example, if we're using the word scared instead of aggressive and explosive, if we use seeking connection or seeking relationships instead of attention seeking, if we use insecure instead of manipulative, those changes in and of themselves, a reframe of the behaviors makes our responses more compassionate and is more likely to support healing so fight, flight, or freeze, those are the, the, those are the, seem to be the core biological responses to overwhelming uh, danger. So fight and flight behaviorally can look like being oppositional, engaging in power struggles, being aggressive, explosive, hands clasp and fists, kicking, hitting, throwing things, um, attention seeking, being manipulative or being overly dramatic. Um, yes, and so then also freeze. I want to just recap freeze. This is, this is actually an image that you see on the slide of 9-11 um, when one of the places, one of the planes had just hit. If you'll notice in the picture, there's only one person who's actually turned in a flight response. The rest of folks are, are pictured here in a freeze response. It's very natural and it's the most common to the most fearful situations and certainly most common to what happens for sexual assault survivors. What freeze can look like behaviorally is daydreaming, having difficulty paying attention, being disorganized, having trouble completing tasks, headaches, stomach aches, really having a very low energy or very flat affect. Freeze can also look like isolating and withdrawing, not having uh, many friends or having no friends, and then alcohol and drug use and abuse. These are all behavioral ways 
that people um, can manifest that they're in freeze. Unfortunately for sexual assault survivors, freeze often leaves survivors feeling guilt or being victim blamed for not doing more to defend themselves. You know, why didn't you fight a little harder? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Well, I'm in freeze. I'm in the most fearful place I've ever been in my life. Someone else has control over what's happening to me. And so um, I think freeze is considered the most, um, the response to the most fearful of threats. And at the same time, it's also a very hopeful response. To fight another day. It's a survival response. No, no wonder you should I kept looking for the, um, yes, <laughs> I kept looking for the picture. What the, where's my picture? Okay, guys, here's the freeze slide. And if you take a second and you can see everyone's looking up at the building. We have one person uh, way over here on the far left that's decided, you know, I'm getting out of here. Everyone else is just. Okay, so trauma-informed values. I think for me, as I learn more and more about the dynamics of violence and the impact on the body and the brain when violence occurs, when people are living in relationships that are based on power and control, and when the neurobiological work and research started coming out showing the impacts, I kind of settled in thinking that it really fits really nicely with the trauma-informed values that, um, that you see here. There are five of them, safety. I think survivors are always asking, will I be safe here with you? Will I be safe physically? Will I be safe emotionally? And then trustworthiness. Can I really believe that you're gonna tell me the truth? and that you're gonna be honest. The experience for many survivors with mental health related disabilities and substance use is being told one thing is gonna happen and finding out that something else very different is what is happening. Maybe they're told they're going to the doctor's office. Maybe they end up experiencing an involuntary commitment. Um, so trustworthiness is so core. Are you gonna tell me the truth about what's happening here? Are you gonna be honest with me? And then choice, will I be able to make decisions or are you gonna make all of those decisions for me? Are you gonna take away my um, power to choose what happens next in my life? And then collaboration, are you gonna work with me or are you going to um, take control of what happens? We're gonna to work together to decide and to implement what should happen next or what I would like to happen next. And then empowerment. Are you going to support me to find my own way and to find my own voice? I think we can work collaboratively. I think we can still have very appropriate boundaries working with survivors. And yet we can also really work to minimize those power differentials between you as an adult professional and between the survivor of sexual assault or abuse. I think I think it's not a bad idea to use your whole self to communicate that this is your intent. And then also, um, I just wanted to outline for the remainder of our time, we're going to focus on accessibility and the kind of supportive domestic violence and sexual assault survivors that can be used with people with mental health symptoms and um, survivors who also uh, use substances. Um, yeah, I also, I also want to acknowledge that, and, and I've already done so, that yes, we've had a really difficult year with many different kinds of trauma. So take care of yourself. Um, and as we talk through issues related to crisis, self-injury, and suicide, also know that at the end of that conversation, we're going to spend a little time thinking about some activities and some exercises that we can do 
that are very simple, very basic, and available kind of at the drop of a hat um, in terms of grounding and self-care. So we're going to talk about some hard stuff, then we're going to talk about some ways to support ourselves uh, when we're interacting with. have no idea what happened. <laughs> um, okay, I am going to... Let me make you share, let you share your screen here. Okay, I want to make sure I click the right things. Okay, I have a si something up that says host disabled participant screen sharing. Do I say okay? You should be able to at this point. Okay. Um, I did make you the co-host. Okay. You lost, you lost your host ability when you when you fell off, but there you go. Okay, so I was on 24. Uh, see, I might need to go back. There we go. I'm going to go back just a little bit and I think we'll be, yes, here's where we are. There you go. Okay. I have no idea what happened, but um, I'm glad I'm back. Thank you. Thanks for the message, Heidi. Um, okay. So I think when abuse survivors seek our services, it's because they are in crisis and that's going to carry over into the everyday life as they come into shelter or as they move into our housing programs or when they're receiving um, individual or group support or counseling services. And in all of our interactions with them as they are striving, maybe struggling for, you know, how to gain access to the supports they need and also how to um, stabilize. So I think I was, I'm not sure how far I got, but I was talking about the idea of doing advanced planning for crisis, very much like we do advanced planning for medical issues. I think it's a great idea to create an action plan or a crisis plan with each survivor as they come into service, if not at intake, because I know there's so much that has to happen during an intake, but fairly soon thereafter, so that we are asking the survivor if things are not okay, if you are in crisis, how do you want us, what do you want us to do? So that even in the midst of a crisis, that survivor is having some control over what happens. I think you can develop a de-escalation plan um, with every survivor that's willing, as I said, either at intake or as soon as possible. And then with the survivor's permission, you can actually keep that plan on file and then share as needed with other staff or pull it out when there is a crisis and follow as best you can what the survivor has asked for. It's also important that we're paying attention early so that it, we're intervening. We're, and I know this is very, very hard to do. There, there, if, you're, if your work is like us, we're often understaffed and have a waiting list. And so it's really hard to give a whole lot of focused attention. But if we can recognize when things are not okay in shelter, in the housing, um, in, our front, in our front office, when we notice that something is not okay, the sooner we can intervene, the more likely we'll be able to support the person through that crisis. Some of the early, early warning signs could be restlessness, just being agitated. Maybe the person is pacing, maybe the person has come to the front desk or to the shelter desk, you know, five, six times within the last 30 minutes to an hour. Um, they may be, the person may be extremely irritable or more irritable than usual. Uh, they could be crying, they could be arguing, they could be, um, they could be in rage. And so if, if it's possible to intervene at that time and find a, a space a, that, that can be private or even outside, you know, can we take a walk? It can be um, much easier to step in 
and explore what, what is needed, what the problem is that needs to be solved. Perhaps you could invite them to take a walk with you um, so that they can rant or cry or be angry or just diffuse some of the emotion without having the distraction of upsetting others or worry about potentially triggering someone else that's in that space for whom that kind of behavior triggers the expectation that there is going to be more violence. Um, that can be very helpful. And if they have an advanced plan, you know, that's the time to pull it out and see how the person wants you to, to work with them. So um, I think I already said a crisis is most likely to be an attempt to solve a problem. And so our goal is to see what we can do to understand what that problem is and supporting the person to solve the problem. You know, usually crises are, are short-term, intense disruption of the usual ways that a person is coping or problem solved. Um, so I think overall an effective intervention is just trying to understand what the problems are and what we can do to support solving them. We can help the person separate the past from the present through a grounding or orienting the person. Uh, the message is you are safe now in this moment at this time. You are safe here with us. You can also um, offer choices and opportunities. Um, it can also be a way to stay connected with the survivor as a person who cares about them in the moment. You can try to see what the connections are between their past experience and then the present behavior and feelings that they're experiencing. Um, it's also a time that you can be active, offer physical space, offer enough physical space for the distress so that the person is not crowded. If it's really a big, if it's a really big response and there's a lot of rage, you don't want to invite a person to come into a small closed room with you. That's probably not going to be enough space to contain the level of emotion that's happening. So see if you can provide the space that seems to be the best match with whatever is, is happening. Um, explore what the problem might be. If the person has worked with you to create the safety plan, then of course, this is the time to bring that out. You have directives um, for, for what they're gonna want um, to happen. So communication is also really important in those times of crisis. Um, you know, asking the person what they need, even if it's a need you can't meet, it can give you an idea of what the person's state of mind is. The really difficult part here sometimes is that part of our role can be to model calmness, to be empathic, to be patient, and to find the connection, allowing that physical and that emotional space. And so one of the ways we can respond to crisis is relaxing ourselves. So it's much easier to settle and to respond to distress if there are other calm nervous systems in the room with you. We can talk firmly and in a non-threatening way, but we can also model patience. We can model being empathic and we can try to find that connection. If the person uses aggressive or insulting words, just don't respond, just move on, allow for the physical space to contain the intensity. I think I've already said that. Um, if we close in on a person that's experienced as threatening, that is probably going to escalate. If you express your own thoughts and your own feelings about what is happening, that can actually be very supportive. For example, not expressing how your, um, what your assessment is of what's going on but how what's going on is making you feel. For example, when you throw things like that, I feel really afraid that someone might be hurt. 
what that can do is maybe give words to things that that survivor has felt in, in the past, but have not been able to express. You know, when you throw things or when I hear the door slam or when, you know, you've thrown a dish across the room or when you've backed me in the corner, I feel afraid. I feel afraid that I'm going to be hurt. And just to give a voice to that can be very supportive to a survivor. Speak from your own experience for, from what is happening um, can also keep keep a crisis from moving into a place of blame or shame. And it's much less likely to shut the person down or distress um, or to, to have more distress. Sometimes being present and being calm and doing nothing is actually the best thing that you can do. If a person is operating in fight or flight mode, you're not gonna be able to reason or problem solve anyway. So the person needs to feel safe enough to settle. Then maybe they can talk about the problem or maybe that's gonna happen another time. You have a conversation about the difference between anger and violence when you try to resolve or negotiate a conflict. If we use anger as a signal that something needs to be addressed rather than a sign of imminent danger or risk of violence, um, that can be a much more a productive. Um, I actually had something I wanted to say and it left. So I'm going to move on and I'm sure it will come back because it was, it was relevant. <laughs> okay. So um, what about, what do you do when a person tells you that they have a mental health related diagnosis or symptoms? I mean, that's kind of like, what do you do with that after someone has shared with you? Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm bipolar or I'm depressed or um, someone has said I have a, um, someone says I um, have a personality disorder or I have a diagnosis of this or that. What do, you, what do you say? What can you do after someone takes such a huge risk to share a diagnosis or symptoms with you? As Heidi was talking about, um, there is huge, huge risk. And there's so much stigma in our culture and our society about mental health and substance use. When that is shared, that is a huge um, risk that the person is taking to let you into that part of their, their life or their world. And so it's helpful to know that they're probably not asking you to solve a problem for them at that time. And if the person doesn't want to talk any further about it or doesn't ask for any help, um, it's just important um, at that time to just be with the knowledge that they've shared and not overwhelm them by asking a lot of questions or making a lot of suggestions. Um, on the PowerPoint slide, there's a list of some things that you could ask. You certainly want to probably wouldn't want to go down the whole list, but some things that you could ask the person is, you know, what, what does this mean to you? We might find that the label means one thing to us and something completely different to the person. We could ask, you know, what is hard for you about that right now? Or who gave you that diagnosis? Maybe the diagnosis is 10, 15 years old and it, it wasn't accurate in the first place. We know that very often the same person can see several different um, medical or mental health professionals and come back with different diagnoses. They're not always accurate. And so um, knowing what it means to the person may be more important than knowing exactly um, what, the, what that diagnosis is or what you may know about the diagnosis. You can ask if they've ever received treatment and was it helpful, was it unhelpful? And then of course, always, is there anything we can do to support you with that? And you can ask if the person has um, participated in any support groups around their mental health needs or around their diagnosis. So the next question um, that 
that we're often asked is, you know, well, how do, how do we make sure that if someone comes in and they have a major mental illness or a um, long, chronic mental illness, are they going to do harm in our setting? Because aren't most people with mental health disabilities dangerous? Well, I know that in the news, if a person does have a mental health related need or history or there's record of, and some form of violence occurs, very often the mental health is paired with that, um, with that event. And I honestly feel a, a level of a lack of surety for what I'm gonna say next because our world has been so different the last year and a half. There is so much violence and all of our mental health is impacted by what has been happening over the last couple of years of our life. And so I, I wanna say what I had planned to say, but with a huge caveat that I am certainly not the last word on this. I'm sharing you know, what I know, I'm sharing what I've observed, what I've studied, but I would say, you know, fellow victim service workers take it a bit with a grain of salt, okay? Because I don't really know. I am gonna share what I do know. And that is that most people with mental health symptoms are not thought to be aggressive or violent. However, the risk for violence for any person really increases if the person is feeling frustrated or dismissed or degraded or judged or controlled or trapped. So that's true for all of us. It's very, very hard to be trapped, to be backed in a corner, to have someone else making every decision for us and not have a degree of anger or a dr drawn towards fighting back to, to free ourselves. So um, keep that in mind, but we also know that there are some there are some predictors of violence that are not necessarily associated or not at all associated with a uh, mental health. And so I wanted to I want to talk through those. Um, I think probably after the last couple of years, we're going to see a lot of follow-up. We're gonna see a lot of research um, that is gonna help inform us about these intersections of violence and mental health and substance abuse and racism and poverty and many other variables that do impact our health and our well-being. But what we have now is a pretty solid view that mental health and violent behavior are primarily linked through an accumulation of risk factors. For example, does the person have a history of violence? This is actually thought to be the strongest predictor. Were they in juvenile detention? Did they experience physical abuse themselves? Do their parents have arrest records? Are they making threats to do harm? And what is the context? Is there something recent that has happened that is extremely um, overwhelming, traumatic? Has there been a recent divorce? Are there child custody issues? You know, what is happening in the person's life? So that we pay attention to that. It's also true that substance abuse or substance use does not cause violence. However, when there is substance use among people that are diagnosed with chronic uh, major mental illness, there does seem to be an increased risk of violence um, significantly. Gender is also um, a predictor. Male, um, the research we have now says that males are more likely to commit um, violence. And then the history of childhood abuse, poverty, and a stressful and unpredictable environment or a person that has little or no, absolutely no social supports. So I think from this list came from the Canadian Mental Health Association's um, research that 
strongest predictors are most likely a history of past violence, threatening to do harm. Yeah, those two. So that is what I know about that. And I'm, if I'm, I'm really interested in hearing from any of you um, if you have other information about this, because I think everyone's mental health is impacted right now in ways that we've never been impacted before, just as a community, as a nation, um, as a world. And I think we're going to face some of these questions going forward as we try to put life back together. Okay, so safety comes first in our work, right? We all know that. If you're fairly new um, to this work, it's really important to, for us to acknowledge that safety is first. Everything we do is to create safe spaces and support the people that we serve. So it's really important that you know your particular agency's procedures if a situation does become dangerous get support from other staff, take any threats of harm seriously, and then remove yourself and others from the situation if it appears that the crisis is really spiraling out, out of control. Recognize that unusual behavior is not necessarily violent or dangerous. It may just be unusual behavior. But if you are working with a person who's overwhelmed, enraged, or threatening to harm someone else or to harm themselves, um, it's really important to not work with that situation alone. So reach out, call for staff backup, call for peer backup, call for your supervisors, your supervisor, supervisor, make sure that you are not working with this situation um, by yourself. If your center does not have a written plan or a procedure for volatile situations, you um, could consider developing one. Your direct supervisor always needs to be involved. And if they're not available, then the, the, the next direct supervisor, the coordinator, the director, whoever is within your space and within your area that has um, decision-making power. You can also call psychiatric services if those are available in your community. And you can call 911 always if you feel the person is in an emergency situation that is beyond your own or your staff's ability to help. Or if you've tried all of the interventions that you know and the situation is still escalating and you become afraid that they're gonna hurt themselves or someone else. Be aware that when you make a call to 911 that your local law enforcement may or may not have training in trauma-informed responses, and especially when they're working with survivors who have a disability. This is actually a really, um, this is actually a really good thing to do in your community is if, and, and many of you probably already are, is to engage law enforcement in training on what trauma um, how to respond to their calls in more trauma-informed ways. Okay, so next I wanted to talk about medication. Uh, medications do help. I'm personally all for any medication that improves my quality of life and the quality of life of people around me and helps support me in um, achieving my goals and, and aspirations in life. Medication can help, but it's not going to cure. It can help manage symptoms. Medications do not make mental health related disabilities go away. And very often it's uh, very much a trial and error process to get the right medications in the right dosage and the right mix. So um, if the person that you're working with cannot remember the name of previous medications that, they, that have been helpful, you can um, ask them if they would like support or help in getting a new prescription. Some of the other questions that you can ask if a survivor is on medication. Um, oops, so 
Sorry, guys, go back. Um, are those medications working effectively? Are there any side effects that they would want you to know about? And would they like support or help in setting up a plan for taking their medications? You know, for many people that live with trauma, the medications, the anxiety, post-traumatic stress, and other mental related disabilities, um, can they can be helped. And your survivor may show up at shelter or housing or in your front office with needs for the assistance of medication. You may already be working with survivors that need assistance in learning more about the medications that they're taking and the side effects and how they could access mental health support services in your area or the area where they will be moving or in the areas close to shelter if they're coming into shelter. Um, it's really important to try to find a medical professional to help provide that information to the survivor. In the appendix section of Beyond Labels, we, we have placed a lot of information about diagnoses, medications, um, and support services, but it's really, I think it's really better if you have someone, a pharmacist, a psychiatrist, a, a doctor, explain this information. So the task for us is to connect that person with um, credible mental health services rather than us trying to provide that information. Some of the medications need to be very closely monitored to prevent toxicity and to make sure that the lowest dose possible is being prescribed. Most of the medications also require anywhere from four to six weeks to take their full effect and most likely would need to be um, discontinued if they were discontinued. Um, in a paced way and slowly to prevent withdrawal symptoms. Because rape crisis centers, domestic violence services are often shorter termed, some survivors may actually come in, you know, begin to, to take advantage of medications to support their mental health needs and then actually leave before that medication is fully effective. Some of the side effects are really difficult. Things like blurred vision, weight gain, potential organ damage, dry mouth, changes in appetite, difficulty concentrating, muscle spasms, restlessness, tremors, dizziness, agitation. You know, these are all the things that you read as the side effects on the medication your doctor has just prescribed you and you go, why would I take that, right? Insomnia and fatigue can also be part of the effects of um, psychotropic medication. To the degree that some people actually decide that working with their original symptoms is going to be less trouble and easier than trying to work with medication. It's also common that some people begin taking medication, they start to feel better, and then they stop because they are feeling better and decide they don't need them. Um, a person may, and, and, and so a person may just choose to not take medication. Um, and if that's the, the case, it's okay, I think, to open discussion about what their experiences or what their thoughts are about why that's not supportive to them. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to note, it's important that we don't make really quick judgments about safety safety of the staff, safety of other survivors, based on whether or not a person is taking medication or decisions about whether or not medication could benefit the survivor. And then it's also, um, I think it's part of our, our work, it's part of our support, it's part of our job to be supportive with survivors about whatever decisions um, that they have made regarding psychotropic medications or medication to support mental health disabilities. So the next thing we're gonna to move to is um, to talk a little bit about uh, self-injury. Ruta Mazalis, who is editor of The Cutting Edge and has done a lot of work and um, research on self-injury 
is the professional that we've drawn most heavily on and from with this information. So I wanted to acknowledge that first. Um, Ruta suggests that we focus first on the trauma and not the self-injury. It's also important to allow the survivor to direct their healing process. Set appropriate boundaries. Yes, everyone needs to be safe. Refuse to stigmatize around self-injury. And then um, if you're unsure whether or not a survivor is coming into service um, self-injures, you can always ask, um, have you ever felt like you needed to hurt yourself to manage overwhelming feelings? Or what helps when you're feeling this way? Or what can we do to help you? Are you interested in talking about some other coping strategies? So these are some just some very basic questions that you can ask if you are unsure whether or not um, one of your survivors that you're working with is coping with the impact of violence through self-injury. Actually, one of the most common reasons that people self-injure is just to be less overwhelmed by the feelings, to help control the pain and the injury that is tangible, that is real, can help manage that sense of being engulfed by emotional pain and feelings. The emotional pain is usually greater than the physical pain of the wound for some survivors. Another reason people self-injury injure is that it can communicate something about the abuse without using words. And it, it can help release anxiety. Some of the other reasons that Ruta points out is that it can also help diminish suicidal uh, feelings by diminishing that despair that they may feel. Self-injury can also relieve, release endorphins, which brings a sense of relief. Um, having a wound or a scar can validate emotional pain. Watching the wound heal can help the person hope for emotional healing. Sometimes self-injury is also used as self-punishment for uh, decisions uh, that the person may have made or ways that they're feeling. It can also be used to gain a sense of being alive and being in control and gaining mastery of the past by being in charge of what hurts. The person may actually be able to cope better with the original trauma if they're in control of some part of their hurting. It's difficult to estimate the actual number of people who self-injure, but research that, that I was able to access, act, gain access to um, tells us that about 4% of adults in the United States, um, about 15% of teens, and about anywhere from 17 to 35% of college students engage in some level or at high risk for self-injury. The traditional treatments um, have focused on eliminating that behavior as quickly as possible. Using the model, people, using this model, people were often treated with psychotropic medications, behavioral contracts, restraint, and unfortunately restraint and seclusion sometimes. Um, Although I think these methods did work in the short term, they often increased the long-term self-injury. And many survivors found those treatments, as, as you would imagine, to be a further traumatizing or re-traumatizing. So, uh, so again, it's important to focus on the trauma first. Some survivors that you work with find that the personal connection in psychotherapy can be useful. Others use workbooks or self-injury on self-injury or support uh, groups on self-injury to better understand the behavior and then what those unmet needs are that the self-injury is filling. I would encourage you, whatever the survivor you're working with chooses, it's important to allow them to direct their own healing process without punishment, without stigmatizing, um, I think in the same way Heidi was talking about supporting survivors who are 
um, use substance or have addiction, um, substance addiction, work with, you can work with the person to reduce the potential for uh, serious harm. Uh, you can also let the person know that it's not respectful to the community at large if the person is cutting or injuring themselves in a communal setting or if they're, for example, coming to a communal setting or coming to dinner with wounds that are bleeding in, in group meetings or other public areas. And then it can also be um, a health and safety concern for bloodborne diseases. And it's okay to share this information. It's, it's, I think it's much more important to our relationship with any survivor that we're being truthful, that we're being honest about what the risks are and the impact of, of self-injuring in communal spaces. We can also ask the survivor what they do to take care of the injury. For example, is medical care going to be required? Um, you know, what is, what is going to be needed to keep that person as safe as possible and take care of their injury? You know, it's, it's, it's not helpful to, you know, be shocked or express horror or engage a whole lot about the self-injury. But it is important that if you're going to ask questions about it, make sure that you're doing it at a time that you can actually be with, stay with, sit with the person. Don't open the, don't open the door for a discussion unless you, you're doing it at a time that you can stay with the conversation. Um, Self-injury is also a way that some survivors are striving to integrate the trauma that happened in their lives and um, the energy around that can be reduced. You know, on the other, on, 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 on one hand, there are, are risks with self-injury. Sometimes a person may go too far and, and, and much more seriously hurt themselves. So there are risks. However, there are also risks if the person's method of self-injury is taken away too soon they may choose a different and sometimes more violent or more harmful form of self-injury. So um, I think to, 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 to learn more about self-injury, I really would encourage you to check out Ruta's work. Um, she, she has publications on understanding and responding to people who live with self-inflicted violence. She's also editor of a newsletter called The Cutting Edge, a newsletter for people living with self-inflicted violence that teaches and provides information about the ways that self-injury is not the same thing as being suicidal. Some counselors um, do encourage survivors who are interested in addressing self-injury to slowly modify, maybe choose one day a week, and then two days, um, eventually, eventually adding more and more days. Um, you know, one of the things I'm, one other thing I'll mention about self injury that I've learned is that, and then we're going to move on and, and talk about suicide. Um, often, people who self injury were invalidated at a very early age about how they saw the world, about what they were feeling. There were certain feelings that were absolutely not allowed often. And so they also did not in those early formative years often have role models so that they could learn how to express and how to cope with you know, everyday human emotions. So I think the, again, the common form, the common denominator, the common, um, experience for people who, see, who, who do self-injure is um, early histories of violence and early histories of trauma. There is a concern that some people who self-injury may go too far uh, and, and seriously hurt, which I mentioned just a little bit ago, but also that they may actually um, kill themselves. And so, um, at the same time, balanced with the fact that 
self-injury is not the same thing as being suicidal. That's not usually the purpose. Usually the purpose is to relieve pain and it can help a lot of people who feel suicidal to not ex commit violence. However, we know that there are some survivors that are at risk for suicide. And so we're gonna talk about that for just a minute. Um, most depressed people are not suicidal, but most suicidal people are depressed. If, if, if you want a really easy to use suicide risk assessment, I would suggest you use um, Dave's suicide risk assessment, which is called Plaid Pals. It outlines some questions that are, uh, make it really easy to assess the levels of risk. And then you can also find risk assessments on SAMHSA website, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. But Dave's Plaid Pals outlines um, some questions and some considerations that can support you in determining um, how, what the level of risk is. The first one is explore, does the person have a plan? Could the person die if they implement the plan? Do they have a means to carry out the plan? Does the person have physical or mental health symptoms? Does the person have chronic or situational depression? Have they made previous attempts? How many and how recent? Do they have a support system? Or are they dealing with whatever's going on in their life um, by themselves right now? Has there been a loss recently? Have they experienced a death, a job, and a relationship ending? And then substance abuse. Does the cur person currently or chronically use drugs and alcohol um, or other medis medicines? So I think when, when you suspect or when you have a feeling that someone may be at this place making decisions about whether they want to live or not, I would say trust, trust your instinct. If you think someone, you need to check in with someone, you need to do that. It's perfectly okay to express your concerns and ask directly without judgment if a person is thinking about hurting themselves. It's usually not helpful to argue, um, but it is helpful to let the person know that you care and that they're not alone and that often suicidal feelings are temporary and the problems can usually be solved. It's really not helpful to try to argue a person out of that, um, those feelings or to be angry. Um, you, it's, also, it's also really valid to ask, are you thinking about suicide or are you thinking about self-injury to, to make that distinction sometimes. It's, it's really better to not say things like, don't do this to your family, you have so much to live for. Uh, those kind of uh, statements that are, have a more uh, moral base are not really very helpful. Usually we, we can't affirm and acknowledge that you recognize their pain. And you can also mention um, that you, you know it's real pain, but that it's important to you that they, that they stay, that you're not ready for them to be finished with striving for healing, that you're not, you don't want to see them die, that you, you're not ready to give up on them. And you can make that very clear statement so they know, you know, you're, you're, you're pledging to them, I do care about you, I want to continue to work with you. And, um, I'm not ready to give up and, and I hope you will decide not to be ready to give up. We can help the survivor create a safety plan, um, including the different resources that you know they have in working with you or in their community. And then um, it's also important to never swear or um, agree to keep that kind of information secret. You really, um, you really need to let the people that support you and your agency no, if you're working with someone who you believe is, is contemplating or at high risk for suicide, um, don't leave the person alone. Talk with them about the different options they have for getting help. 
um, let your supervisor or your supervisor's supervisor know because they may have input or information about some assistance that could help. And, and you, we really don't need to deal with such a weighty, serious um, need on the part of a survivor by ourselves. Um, some of the things that you can discuss doing or options that you can present to your survivor is you can go um, and meet with a counselor immediately in your agency if one is available or one could be called in um, or they could go see uh, someone at a local go go and, and do an intake at a local psychiatric hospital or the nearest um, emergency psychiatric service unit you can call 911 you can ask the person if they want to make the call with your support or do they want you to make the call to get help? And um, then I think it's really important that you follow through with the person. And if possible, within your agency and within your agency's guidelines, accompany the person through the next steps that they've defined that they want to take. This may not be possible given your agency um, guidelines and, and um, policies, but if if you can, that is something that you can do that's, that's really supportive to a survivor. You know, let's think about grounding and self-care. What, what do you think about that? Um, this, is, this has been some, for me, this has been some hard stuff to talk about. Yeah, I'm sure it's not easy to hear or to contemplate or to think about. So let's switch our focus a little bit and think about some really easy um, activities and exercises that different people have shared with me across time um, for grounding and for calming. It does help us do our work more effectively if we can take care of ourselves or have some quick go-tos if we find ourselves in that crisis situation or, or um, you know, like an, oh my gosh, what next situation. So here's really, really simple activities. This activity can help us ground, be more present, and then we can do it any place and at any time. We can focus on our breathing. Notice when our body is making contact and where our body is making contact. I'm sitting in this chair right now. It's actually a really nice chair. It's a home office chair. You know, I have my hands on the, the what do you call them? The arms of the chair, my feet on the floor. I know where I am in time and space. Look around the room, see where your eyes naturally go. What catches your attention? What immediately catches my attention are framed um, puzzles that my grandchildren have put together for me, which are perfect and wonderful and they're up on the wall everywhere. So those catch my eyes very quickly. Chit chat for a moment. Shift your attention to something that's positive. Check in with your body. You know, what's changing? Is there anything changing? And how do we know? How do we know when this settling is effective? We we'll usually notice that our breath slows down. We may be taking deeper breaths. We might feel some release of mus muscle tension. Might be a little less. Um, there may be letting go of some energy that built up to protect us. You may see some of that um, letting go, and. You can experience that as shaking, trembling. You might feel chilled. You might feel hot. Um, you might be sweating. Um, yesterday, I, I had something going on, and it was like I had just built up so much tension around this. And my body just reached a place where it was like, OK, I just have to have a cry. I didn't ask for it. I didn't plan for it. The tears just started coming. And I just let them. I let them flow. And when it was done, it was like, oh, you know? We have to let that energy go sometimes. And these are some really quick ways to, to pay attention to that. Um, Heidi shared this grounding activity with me and I love it because it's so simple and it's so fast and so available. Name five things that we can see. Name four things that you can touch. 
Name three things that you can hear. Name two things that you can smell and one thing that you can taste. And this reminds me of actually, I can actually do most of these things when my granddaughter who is living with us now, she's finishing up college, uh, knocks on my office door here and has a bowl of um, curly fries. I love those, they're terrible things to eat. They're not good for you, but they are so tasty. And she shows up at my door and she'll knock and then she'll hand them in. And so we've got curly fries, we've got a nice bowl, we have ketchup, you know, we have the smells, all of that, that totally grounds me in a very bad way. I'm not recommending that you do curly fries. However, it is a way to ground and it includes what I can see, what I can touch, what I can hear, what I can smell and what I can taste. And then the slide that I think I'm gonna end, um, I think we're, we're almost at 1.30. So I'll go ahead and end with this. Um, connect with your resources. You know, just when I, when I ask myself the question, what makes me smile? I think of something that makes me smile. You know, I think of my husband. I think of my wonderful team at work. I think of, um, what else? My car's in the shop. I won't think of that. Um, you know, what makes me feel strong and confident? What makes you feel good? What makes you feel safe? What makes me feel safe? You know, it's, a, it's actually like a, a sort of a list of resources. Be really good to write this out and put it on my desk and I can reach for it when I need to. What helps us feel connected? This is a treasure chest list that you can create to do those momentary, use those moments for self-care. And then be kind to yourself. I love the idea of hugging. I actually learned this in, in some therapy, some like, I don't know, 10 years ago, where my therapist was like, you know, just let, hug yourself. Contain yourself. Give yourself a hug. Talk to someone who's calm. Talk to someone you trust. Find something that you like to look at that makes you smile. Take time to walk around. Stretch. Drink water. All of these are tiny things, easy to do, but they're kindnesses. And I don't know about you, but I honestly get caught up in what I'm doing and I forget to drink water. You know, I forget to take a break. I, you know, I forget that I have really cool neighbors and I should get out on my front porch and visit a little bit more rather than staying here and, and being often isolated during my day. These are really practical things that I want to, um, they're very basic, but they're also based on science um, and based on the work of Peter Levine, uh, Maggie Klein, Chris Downing in their work um, of some somatic experiencing. So um, take care of yourself. Uh, we had some other interventions that are you'll find at the end of your slide. Um, Heidi, we were going to present those, but we're out of time but they're very easy to, to read. You can skim through them. You can walk out your door or walk into your office and um, things that you can begin practicing immediately today. Um, yeah. So I think that's it. Heidi, is there anything I've missed that's really critical that we, we need to say? No, I don't think so. Um, thanks, Shell, for all your work on this. It's always a joy to hear you present on this topic. You're so knowledgeable. Well, that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> so, so do you want to say like a, 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 let's see, do we have 60 sec? Oh, no, we don't. We're out of time. Can she give a 10 minute plug for an amazing resource that she's working on? Yeah, 10 second one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're, my coworker and I, Megan Westmore, finalizing our um, safer sexuality and healthy relationships curriculum for adults with IDD. We developed this curriculum primary primarily as a sexual assault prevention curriculum. Um, but if you know anyone who would benefit from it, it's going to be a free resource for all that's going to be on our SAFE website. So that's just safeaustin.org. Um, and we hope to have it um, up and available by the end of August. Um, and Michelle, I can send you, I can no, let you know when it's officially up there, but um, encourage you to access that and share it um, when it's available in, in about a month. You bet. Thank you, Heidi. Thanks. So I have one more request, Michelle. Go ahead. Two seconds. 
if folks will go to safeaustin.org forward slash disability, you'll pull up our program's web page. And we've recently posted a safety planning guide that is a work in progress. And we would love any of you that um, are interested to take a look at it, try it, give us feedback. You can, you can email Heidi or myself. Let us know if it works and what we should change, what we should throw out or what we should add. So, okay, thank you very much. Okay.